Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime Entertainment. I have here a very special guest. I've been waiting to get this man on the show here for a minute. Our schedule's finally lined up to do so. I have here Mr. Joey Seifer. Joey, how are you, my friend? Good, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate oh, it. No, yeah, no problem, man. I'm excited to have you on. Now, you have some ties to some people that we've had on our show in the past. Guys like Red Met, guys like Chuck Maselli, and we'll get into your relationships with them later on. Sure. But kind of the big tie-in is your father was heavily connected with the Chicago outfit um, with guys like Joe Lombardo and then Tony Spilatro and kind of the a lot of people that were heavily involved in, if anybody's seen the movie Casino, some of those guys back in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it led to a, a traumatic event that happened, unfortunately, while you were there as a child. And we'll get into that, too. But, you know, mostly around your father. Your father was involved with these guys. Right. So, what we like to do here, uh, especially if it's your first time on, we're going to try to go from the beginning and then work our way up forward. You can explain a little bit about your background, who your father was from your eyes as a kid, and then we'll get into kind of what he was doing with these other guys and then obviously that event, and then we'll just kind of work forward. Sure. Well, for me as a kid, I don't – honestly, I don't remember him at all. Really? I don't, I don't remember anything. You know, he got killed when I was four years old. Okay, so you were four. And, I wasn't sure you're. Yeah, I was. Age. I was super young. So I, uh, you know, I always get stories as growing up. Oh, you don't remember this, and you don't remember that. I was like, no, it's fucking four years old. <laughs> like, yeah, well, no, yeah, I don't. I don't. You know, I don't. I don't remember. And usually, way up, you know, if you have a traumatic event, your your memory gets like wiped. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I was super young. So I, I honestly, the only thing I learned about my dad was as growing up, asking some questions. Um. And then as I got a lot older, I started to do a lot more investigating and stuff like that. And that's when I really learned about, you know, who he was involved in my family's lineage with him and his father and his grandfather, you know, they went all the way back to Al Capone. Right. So it's like in the family, the uncle, my uncles were involved in, and so on. Um, but he got involved when he was, he was young. He was in his early, early twenties. Um, so this would be mid sixties, roughly. Uh, he got involved. He was, a uh, you know, city kid just trying to make money, figuring out a way to, you know, scam <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, make some money. And he had an idea. He was doing some, uh, some construction, you know, home remodeling shit. And, uh, one of the guys that he was talking to one of his friends, uh, said, Hey, I got somebody that needs some work done at their house. So he introduced him and it kind of, everything kind of snowballed from there where he got involved with, uh, Irv Weiner, Alan Dorfman, you know, he got involved. Uh, he met, uh, Joe Lombardo. That was a little bit later on, but then that's when he met Joe Lombardo and, and the whole thing came into the scam, you know, they were, they were siphoning money from the Teamsters pension fund, which as most people know, was going through the casinos. Right. And then they were pulling, you know, kicking all this money back. Right. Yeah. So the Teamsters fund for a lot of people that don't know, like you said, was kicking out to build these casinos. If you ever seen the movie casino, that kind of yeah. explains it loosely. Yeah. Uh, getting the money from the Teamsters fund, which obviously a lot of people know related to Jimmy Hoffa, um, which, you know, that's a whole nother episode altogether, but one of yeah. the, why he wound up, disappearing but that that you know financed a lot of the stuff out there in vegas now correct me if i'm wrong because recently your father's um show was on reels i forgot the name of it so yeah what was the name of that show that was the documentary that we did and that was called i think they called it the chicago mob deadly associates or that's something. it deadly associates. It was deadly associates yeah now he was pretty close to was it milwaukee phil he was, he was very close to him. Uh, Milwaukee Phil kind of took him because he didn't have a great relationship with his own son. Right. So he kind of took my dad under his wing as like a stand in son, if you will. Now Milwaukee Phil was a tough customer. Yes. Like, I mean, he was, when you want to talk about gangsters, I mean, to he was me, gangster, obviously yeah. you have your big names, but there's guys that kind of fly under the radar that are like gangsters, gangsters, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and Milwaukee Phil was one of those guys. 
Yeah, he was. I don't think he was flying under no radar, but he was. He no, was no, no. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, not your Charlie Lucky Lucianos and John yeah. and things like that. But you know, guys like Anilio Della Croce, who was, you know, in the Gambinos in New York, one of the most feared and respected gangsters of Sonny uh, Francis. Mm -hmm. You know, same way. Those guys, I don't think, get the recognition they deserve because, you know, some guys just steal the spotlights like Gotti and, and stuff like that. But, yeah, yeah, Milwaukee Phil was a, was a t anything that I've ever read on him and reports that I've read and people that I've spoken with. I mean, he was a tough customer. He was not one to be trifled with. His word meant something. If you were yeah. under him, you were protected. And I think your your father definitely, you know, benefited from having somebody of his stature. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, how did when, they meet? Do you know how they met? Uh, that I don't remember. No, okay, no, but um, that was one of the you know, the jokes that my mom loves <clears throat> or she loves to you know, throw at me that you know, we had a choice of a couple names and Felix was one of them, so they they picked Joey, of course, but you know, they were gonna name me after El uh, after Felix too, so. <laughs> Right. Now, the business that your father had, what, what was it exactly? I know you said it was something to do with construction. Was uh, I forgot what it was. In the well, he started doing that just as odd jobs to make money. But his, his dream at that time was fiberglass. That's, you know, something fiberglass. that was becoming That's extremely cool. hot back then. And, yeah. you know, a big thing. Corvettes, boats, sinks. I mean, all different types of shit they were making yeah. out of fiberglass. So he went to the guys and he had this business idea. And they said, well, we'll front you the money obviously to start it. Yeah. And they all, they all fronted the same amount of money and all went in. And, uh, that's how that fiberglass business started originally with all of them. And after a short period of time, they brought, that's when they brought Joe Lombardo in to kind of oversee and, and, you know, watch things. Right. So, I mean, how did this, obviously, you know, when, when guys like that front you money for a startup business, they're not doing it out of kindness of their heart, you know, right. they're looking for something on the back end, just like if anybody's seen shows like Sopranos and stuff like that, if they front you and get you started, that's not a, a, a one-time loan. They're going to look for something continuously coming on the back end. Right. So how did this go sideways? Like where was the beginnings of it going south? And, you know, cause I know the, the FBI actually contacted your father first, I believe if I'm not mistaken. Right. 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 So it, what happened was, is they had a company, they opened, you know, they had the company here, the fiberglass company here. They had another one in New Mexico okay. and that was the pale company. Was, I think it was called American pale or something like that, which was basically what? just, it was an empty building. It was literally an empty building with some shit in it and dust. Now the one but in Chicago, was, was that American bonding or my no name? American bonding was something separate. That was okay. completely okay. separate. Yeah. Um, no, this was American pale and okay. you know, they had it as a running company and the whole thing which of course there's was never anything there, but they were running invoices in and out of it like a regular company. Mm -hmm. And he was in with that with uh Spilatro, with Tony Spilatro. And what they ended up doing was there was another partner named Harold Lurie. And what had happened was at some point the feds got to Harold Lurie, which was a weaker individual and they flipped him which nobody else knew about. So they're just carrying on business as usual while this Harold Lurie's already flipped and they're getting all the information that they need. They wiring him up and everything. Yeah. I mean, their books, everything. So by the time they get to my dad, I mean, that ship sunk, you know? Yeah. And yeah. my dad doesn't they know. He doesn't know that they flipped the guy. Yeah. Um. So that's, that's the start of where things go bad. Wow. Okay. So when they approached your dad, like how, what was, you know, to the best of your knowledge, what was his first reaction? And, you know, then ultimately, you know, how did he decide to play that card? I think all I, from my understanding was it was basically uh yeah, that's nice. Fuck you guys. See you later. You know, and then it goes back to, you know, Joe Lombardo and he's talking and they're going back and forth and they're telling my dad, listen, you just got to do this, you know, do your time, go, you're going to go away for a little while, do your time. We'll take care of everybody and you'll come back out you know, short period of time, everything will go back to business as usual. Everybody will start making money again. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, obviously none of us know the exact conversation, but at some point my, you know, my dad was like, mm, no, that's not going to work for me. We're not going to do that. Um, and they come up with this, this idea of, well, if we just, 
Because again, they don't know about Harold Lurie already flipping. So they're like, well, if we just get rid of this factory with all the, you know, the books and the paperwork in it, then we're all clear, right? You know, fucking torch it, burn it down. What they didn't understand is when they burnt it down, they made it a crime scene. So that gave them all free reign to walk in and go, oh, shit. you know, so they had, they, at that point, then they got enough information of what they had, you know, and things were tense. They were, they were pressuring the feds and the IRS were pressuring my dad. Lombardo and his guys are pressuring my dad. And so he's my, getting it you know, from all sides. Yeah. He's getting it. There's no peace. You know, he's getting it from both sides. He doesn't know what to do. He's pushing back. Um, he doesn't want to go to jail. Uh, and you know, the whole thing comes down to September when they killed him. So, I mean, before this, and we're, we're obviously going to get into that and those events. And unfortunately, as we'll get into, you know, you were there, you weren't supposed to be, but you were, right. you were there. Right. Um, I can't imagine what your dad was feeling because like you said, he's getting it from the FBI, the IRS, they're threatening this, they're threatening that. Then mm -hmm. on the flip side, you have, I'm sure, as, as he known, living in Chicago, one of the most powerful groups there is that you know what the outcome could be if they decide that you're a loose end. That, that had to be just like a gigantic fucking ulcer just eating him right through the stomach. I mean, I can't. Well, yeah, and on top of it, these guys, I mean, it's not like the outfit was new to him. You know, this. Right. The family was involved with the outfit when he was a kid and even before he was even born. So it's not like. It's not like these guys didn't know the family and didn't know him at that point, you know? Um, and yeah, it's, it's a, like you said, it's a gigantic ulcer. You're getting it from all sides. And then you got the, the, the feds that come in and say, we're going to, you're going to be our star witness. Not still not telling them about Harold Lurie, but also what kind of star witness doesn't get Witsack yeah. for protection or any kind of fucking protection. He's left a fend for himself. Yeah, they had. To, ooh, that almost makes me question the feds' motives there for a point because you can't. Well, there have was some, dirty feds too. Yeah, you can't have somebody like you said if you're going to be a star witness to go against the Chicago outfit and you're not going to move them. Yeah, that doesn't sound very up and up. Move them or even protect them at that point. Yeah, <clears throat> and this is you know this is the heyday of this is the seventies. This is when the the outfits at their most powerful. Yeah. Wow. So ultimately, I mean, what does your dad make a decision? Does he tell him, Hey, look, I'm not, you know, going to go to jail. I mean, what is, what is the, what, I guess, what was the final say? So into making the mob decide that it was just better to take him out. Did he say he was going to talk? I mean, what exactly happened there? Well, I think Joe <clears throat> Lombardo kept pushing and pushing and pushing and saying he was very close with our family. He did not want this to happen. Um, he had actually gotten in trouble for going that day, which we'll talk about, like you said, in a little bit, but he did not want this to happen. He was very close to the family and he knew that the people that were being picked for this, were going to kill everybody that was there. Meaning my mom would have gotten killed too. So he was pushing my dad to listen. You got to listen. You got to listen. You got to trust me. You got to just do this, you know, and he's trying. I mean, he's trying, he's tried 15 times. And then he talks to my uncle and my uncle's pushing my dad and, you know, everybody's pushing him for whatever reason, my dad was just not having it, you know? And, and by that time that they had to make the choice that they made to, you know, we, we, we have to do something here or it's going to go bad for everybody and kill this cash cow, which that cash cow lasted after he got killed and Harold Lurie folded on the stand. That cash cow lasted like another, what was it? Seven, eight years at least mm -hmm. that they were pulling money from the you know, casinos. Wow. So the day that they, all of this happens. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong, because mm -hmm. I, I like to say things that I've heard, not things that I know. Sure. Obviously that's why I get guys like you on here that's involved to give me things that you know. So you were supposed to be in school. Right. Did not go to school that particular day. I hated that school. They had me in this school that was a, uh, it was an old, I don't even, I think it was still active too. It was an old church, like this old wooden church. It was actually on church road or church street. And, um, you know, you were down in this stuffy basement. All you could smell was green beans and like wood. I don't know. It was the weirdest. It was, I hated the place. That's all I can say. And I was like, you know, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. My stomach hurts, blah, blah, blah. 
I'm going to go. My mom's like, okay, fine, whatever. You know, my dad was supposed to go have a meeting. My mom was just going to be taking care of cleaning the office and doing some small shit. She's like, fine, grab your Hot Wheels or, you know, Matchbox, whatever. Grab your cars and you can go and just hang out and play all day. So I'm, you know, great. That's awesome. But yeah, I, I couldn't stand that school. So you're, you're there and this is at the business, correct? Or the, right. Okay. Right. This is at the second fiberglass company after they burnt the first one down, my dad right. and my mom left and started a second one. And also by this time, your father was pretty cautious. Like he, I guess maybe almost in the back of his mind was expecting maybe something to oh, yeah. take place in the documentary. It showed him, you know, in the reenactments kind of peeking out the window and, yeah. you know, just kind of living basically in fear, I guess you would say. Yeah, for and you know, even at the there was a period of time that he pushed back on the outfit too to say, Listen, you guys are crazy, but you don't understand I'm crazier. You know, where they were in a factory, it was uh Lombardo, Spalatro, and there was somebody else there. I can't remember who else. And my dad, my he has my mom the night before sew up a fucking ski mask. It's in the summer, sew up a ski mask and it doesn't change his clothes, but he puts a ski mask on, walks in the front door start shooting his gun off over their heads. And by the time, you know, they're ducking and running and shit, he runs out, takes the ski mask off, throws it in the bushes in the front and fucking walks back in the door. was like, what the hell's going on? Did you see this guy? And, you know, they all know that it's him, but they're like, this, this dude's like, he's unhinged, you know? Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, you know, he, I think they were a little, uh, you know, I think that's why they went, I don't want to say overboard, but I think that's why they went overboard with the amount of people that they sent that day. Right. Because they knew that he had, there were guns everywhere. He always carried a gun. There was well, even, even guns aside, your father was no slouch either. He was a tough no. customer. I mean, he was good with yeah. his hands. Yeah. He was um, a street kid. Yeah. 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 I didn't yeah. want to gloss over that. Cause I, was it something? And it may have been said in the documentary or something that I've heard because I talked with so many people. I watched so many different things. I read so many different things that all kind of blends together, but wasn't like, was there a point where he was trying to get in there and actually fight with Tony? Not in a, a phys not in a, a argumentative way, but just to see if he could hang. Well, what they used to do is in the back, you know, boxing was really big back then. Right. And they, they hung a heavy bag in the back of the warehouse and my dad would, you know, hit it and mess around all the time. And when the guys would come in now, Tony didn't, he hated my dad. He did not like my dad. Oh. And even they had, they were made to work together and stuff. He did not like my dad. But uh, Lombardo would always, you know, come on, come on, Tony, fucking box him. Come on, box Danny. Come on, box Danny. And they would always egg him on, you know, to box him. Um, but he would never do it. And, and to clear things up for our listeners, when we talk, when we say the name Tony, we're referring to Tony Spiker, yeah, who was portrayed by Joe Pesci in right. the movie Casino. And that movie, I think his name was Nicky Santoro. Right. So that's who we're referring to when we say Tony Spilatro, also known as Tony the Ant. So that's who we're referring to. And in the movie, they said as much. He was a you know a tough guy. He could fight and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they would try to you know get those two pitted against each other. And I think another reason why they may have sent so many people that particular day to try to you know take care of business, so to speak. Kind of walk us through that day. You know, you're there. You didn't go to school. You're there. You're in the building. Kind of walk us through the events that you remember as best of your knowledge. I know you were pretty young, but mm -hmm. you know, is what you've been able to piece together over the years and the best of your knowledge. Yeah. So the, the one thing you were saying though, is they sent some tough guys, the two toughest guys they sent inside to jump my dad and my dad got away from both of them. Yeah. He got outside. <laughs> and in, in the space that they were in, I'm telling you, it's like a fuck. It's like a shoebox. Like, I mean, to put three people in there fighting, you're like almost shoulder to shoulder the whole time. So it's a super small space and he still gets away from them. Um, so and they, you that know, was Tony and who that was Tony and who and Frank Schweiss, Frank Schweiss. So okay. he's Frank, the German Schweiss, another, yeah. you know, another hit man. Very tough ruthless. Yeah. 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 Ruthless. Um, so the most of the stuff that I remember from that day is I don't remember walking in the front door, but you know, from piecing everything together, we pull in the front door. <clears throat> which was odd because usually the way that my dad would go in is he would go in the other way where he could see the two, there were double doors for the back. So he could see those doors and then he would drive around front on that day. He didn't do it. He just pulled right up front. 
Um, my mom went in and I guess I went in, they brought in, I had this like little Fisher price parking garage that you play with your cars on and put the toys down. And he went back outside to get this big canister vacuum cleaner because my mom was going to vacuum clean and shit. Um, you know, and the office is small, the entryway is small. This isn't like a huge space, you know, from the time that he walks out, that's when, or she starts making coffee. And then that's when, boom, they come busting through the door. Where's, you know, this SOB or whatever they say. And she says, she screams not loud enough. Obviously he's outside. So one guy takes my mom and myself and there's a small little bathroom there and pushes us towards the bathroom right away and stands there with us. The other two guys go up front and jump my dad in the entryway. At some point he walks away and I don't know if my mom went to the desk because she had a gun in her desk. She wasn't carrying it the only day she wasn't carrying it. Wow. He goes to the desk to get the gun. They knock her down, and I'm standing there in the middle watching them fight. Um, finding out later that it's Tony Spilatro that shoots my dad in the cheek. Misses him, you know, doesn't shoot him in the head or anything. Goes right through his cheek, blood all over the wall. He takes off. Um, Frank Schweiss is trying to handcuff him at the same time. He's fighting with both of them. He ends up getting away. And they chase him out the door. So they end up killing him outside, but he's, you know, running all over the place. They're shooting him. He's running. He's going through other, you know, this is like a, an area where it's a bunch of businesses and it's summer. So the doors are open. So he's running through and, you know, it's fucking chaotic. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. They end up shooting him and killing him outside and he's in the grass and everybody takes off. What we find out later and what my mom, she never told me until much, much later, was that the person holding us in the bathroom was Joe Lombardo. That's what I was going to ask. Was that yeah. Joe Lombardo that was holding yeah. you guys? So from him, again, finding out later, he wasn't even, he was told specifically not to go there that day. Even though that this was kind of like his gig, you know, he sponsored Danny, he brought Danny in kind of, you know, so he was, he was technically responsible for what had to get get done right but he uh he was told that he wasn't supposed to go that day and he went that day and i think and i've been told by people that were close to joe lombardo and and a lot of other people that were close to other people that the only reason actually it was redwood matt that told me first he said listen you know the only reason you're alive is because joe went there that day to make sure that your mom was okay they did they had no idea obviously that i was going to be there right but supposedly the crew that was sent was they kill everybody. They don't give a shit if it's a kid or a dog or a bird or whatever. They're going to kill everybody. Yeah. You know. No, I believe that 100%. Um, you or or no you or just your, your mom, I think Frank or Tony would have had no qualms about putting a bullet in either one of you guys. Yeah. Well, we know Frank Schweiss did. He killed his girlfriend. Right. So I mean, we know he had no problem killing women. So Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe red to be a hundred percent accurate in, in saying that, um, really truthfully. And that, and that's something I had heard too. And then, and I'd heard in previous podcasts, you say a guy done this, a guy done that, obviously at four years old, you probably don't know exactly maybe who Joe Lombardo was. Had you ever met him or did you know of him at that point at all? Oh yeah. He used to, I mean, it was uncle Joe. He would okay. come to the house. He okay. would come into the business. Hey kid, how you doing? And every time 20 bucks or 10 bucks, there's, you know, always, Hey kid, here you go. Buy yourself some candy. It's like. 50 bucks, 20 bucks, you know. So like you said, with him kind of sponsoring your father, you, you were in a sense responsible for that person, their actions for them from there on out and what they do in the business. That's, so, that's how, a, that's how a sponsor goes. Or you bring some, same thing with like a motorcycle club. You're correct. You know, if, if I meet you, we're out riding. I say, Hey, you know, I'd like to bring you in and stuff. You come in under me. That means I'm responsible. You fuck up. That means I'm responsible for straightening you out. Yeah. And that's the thing is I think people don't get the amount of pressure that that can put someone under. You just don't want to do that with any and everybody. No, I mean, I'm in no way, shape or form tied to that kind of life, but I don't even like vouching for people for jobs. I'm a welder. I don't even like vouching for people that I don't know. Like very, very good people. Cause they all, oh, I know this guy is a good welder. I'm like, well, look, you might know that guy, 
but I don't fucking know that guy. Right. So right. I'm not vouching for somebody to come in here and do a job that I don't really know they can do. And right. that's similar to that same thing, because when you bring somebody in, be it to make money or, you know, bookmaker or wh whatever the case may be, whatever their specialty is and something happens, you are somewhat responsible. So him being there to, to shield you guys and make sure you guys are protected or your mom, especially, like I said, you being there was kind of a surprise, but that makes sense. And it speaks to what things I've heard about Joe. Yeah. Obviously he was, he was who he was. He was who he was, but I'll but, tell you what, he was straight up. Yeah. Honest guy, caring guy. And you go to his neighborhood. He is a God. Yeah. In his neighborhood, always took care of the neighborhood. People needed rent. He paid the rent people. Kids needed toys or a bicycle. He got that kid that toys or bicycle, you know, food, anything. He took care of the neighborhood. So when, when your dad made it outside, who, to the best of your knowledge, was the one that done the deed outside? Did they catch up with him? Did Frank or Tony catch up with him from inside to outside? Or was there somebody waiting outside? No, there were other guys outside. You know, they had multiple cars. Um, they had multiple people outside. Uh, we were always told that it was Joey Hansen that was outside. But, you know, again, it was... So, Never fully verified. Well, now we've interviewed a guy on our <laughs> show. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chuck Maselli, who you know. Yeah. Yep. And he, his story is that he was actually in the back seat of one of the cars that was there mm -hmm. the day your father got shot. Right. Um, you know, to the best of your knowledge, I know you spoke with Chuck much later on. You didn't know him at the time. Right. You know, do you find that to be something plausible or how do you see that? Um, everything that I've been told, I, you know, I, I, I come from investigating, if you will, for 30 plus years. And then I go into writing a book and then doing a documentary. And I'm very cautious about, or, I'm usually very cautious about what I say or put out there if I can't verify it. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's no way to verify it, I really lean to not wanting to put it out there, not wanting to say it. That's understandable. You know, and um, I haven't been able to verify that at all. There's, there's nothing. I mean, maybe it's true. Maybe he's sitting on some, you know, golden fucking ticket in his pocket, but I've never been able to verify it. And other people that I know haven't been able to verify it. So I don't know. All right. Well, we'll you know. get into him a little bit later on too, because he's possibly making some, some headway uh, in the family secrets case, but we'll get into that here shortly. So after this is over, after your, you know, father's unfortunately taken out by the outfit, you know, what's next for you and your mom? What are y'all steps? How do y'all handle things? Obviously, you know, who's responsible. <laughs> Um, but how do y'all handle things going forward? Well, so it wasn't just me. I have a stepbrother and a stepsister. Okay. So from that point, they leave there, you know, they pick them up. We all go to my grandma's house. But from, from that period, I don't remember a lot. I just know what I've been told. There was, you know, just chaos in the house. My mom's trying to, at that point, pick up pieces and run a, a business, you know, and, and keep up with that. And she's trying to handle three kids that have gone through a traumatic event and then deal with everything herself. And then she's got, which we find out later, crooked FBI agent who's working for Joe Lombardo coming in and trying to see what she knows, you know? Um, so it's, it's chaos. I mean, it's, it's chaos for, you know, my brother ended up leaving early on, uh, moving to Florida, never looked back. Um, my stepsister stayed, and, um, uh, you know, stay with the family and everything, but it was not, uh, it was, it was just not an easy road, you know, not, not at all. Yeah. You know, and as little kids, you know, you kind of like, I don't want to say you forget, but you know, I'm four years old. So, you know, right. six, seven years old, it's still, it's still there, but you're still running around trying to just be a kid. Yeah. You know? yeah. So around what age did you try to start maybe piecing a little bit more together, finding out a little bit more about what your dad, you know, was into the people he was involved with. When did this kind of become a thing for you to, to start really doing a deep dive into? I started messing around with it in high school. You know, it wasn't like a super deep dive, but I was messing around with it in high school and 
you know, I'm old enough that there was, you know, uh, no cell phones, computers, there was Google, there was no Google, you know, you went to the right. library and looked up, you know, newspaper articles. Yeah. You know, so you start looking up newspaper Kids today articles. today have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, you know, I'd look up newspaper articles um, and start, you know, getting some names and stuff like that. But my mom, Stonewall, doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to talk about just, she is under the, you know, just, I think because she knows me and my brother that, you know, just, just leave it, you know, just leave it alone. It's over. It's gone. It's done. You know, it's never going to be solved. You know, at that point you're like, it's never going to be solved. We know who blah, blah, blah. Um, gets more deep. Um, once I go to, I find out about the Bensonville police department in one of the articles. So I go to the police department and, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm here to, you know, I got to ask somebody, I don't know who to ask. I had to ask somebody about a murder that happened, you know, in 74. They're like, I don't know what, what murder are you talking about? So I give them Danny Seifert and they, you know, you see him talking in the back and then all of a sudden they go, I assume it's like supervisor or somebody comes up and is like, well, who are you? And I'm like, so I tell them who I am. And they're like, well, we, we, we can't say anything. It's an active case. I'm like, what do you mean? It's active. Like, what are you guys actively doing? You guys haven't done shit in 30 plus years. Like what, what do you mean active? You know? And I just end up, I, I was like, fuck you guys. And I just walked out, you know? So at that point, time goes by a little bit and I'm not getting anywhere with newspapers. I mean, what am I going to do with newspapers? You know? Yeah. But I end up getting married in a couple of years out of high school. And that's when everything really changed, you know? So I'm living in this North shore community and, you know, North Illinois, but the company that's owned by my in-laws that I just happened to marry into is all the way on the South side in Alsip. So I'm driving an hour South to Alsip and that's when things really start to change. I start meeting people, you know, and at that point, these people I'm meeting, they're outfit guys and they're bikers. So I got the best of both worlds that I'm starting to get, you know, yeah. close to. I mean, what else can I, you know, what else can you ask for at that point? Yeah. And that's when things started to get, you know, a little more, a little more deeper of finding out who people are, where they are, what they're into, who they're associated with. At that point, I had no idea. I was like, I guess dumb because, you know, I was trying, my mom was trying to raise me in like the Brady Bunch. Right. But I had no idea that the bikers and the outfit guys were all like tight. They all work together. Oh, they yeah. all, you know, yeah. so that's when I, you know, that's when I really start finding out more stuff. Now, I don't know if you can say that the group or whatever on air, but I mean, I'm assuming this is one that starts with the letter P maybe up there around that area or no? P, no. No? No, in Illinois, it's all outlaws and hell's angels. Okay. All right. That's, that's know, the state. Know. Okay. So I know pagans are big in like the New York area. Oh yeah. Pagans, that's East Coast. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if they yeah. traveled out quite that far or not. Yeah. No, I these know. are all outlaws and hell's angels in this area. I, I, I won't say which, but yeah, I know, I know both on both sides. <laughs> I know people from both. I had a friend who, uh, well, he was, a, he was an older gentleman. He was in his sixties and we worked together at a big steel plant here in Charleston where I live at, but he was from Philly. And he said that the hell's angels and the pagans were feuding so much. Yeah. And he was in high school. He said they canceled school one day and sent everybody home because they had heard that the pagans and hell's angels was going to have like a, this brawl, I guess, close to wherever the school. Yeah. Was. So in prep for that, they sent him the fuck home because they didn't yeah. know how out of hand this shit was going to get. Yeah. The bikers don't play around, man. They blow shit up. They'll shoot oh, you yeah. right off your bike, man. While yeah. you're going down the highway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, I think, focus a lot on La Cosa Nostra, but in, on the in the motorcycle world, it's just, if not more, ruthless. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, people always talked about, you know, Soprano is obviously one of my favorite shows ever. Sons of Anarchy immediately behind it. And I tell people that Sons of Anarchy is Sopranos on Harley Davidson's. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's essentially what it is. And, and, yeah, and it's and, got, it's got real bikers in it. It's got, yeah. It's got real stories, obviously, you know, stretched for TV. But right. yeah, a lot um, of the guys that was in that show were real bikers in real yeah. life. David LaBrava, who played Happy, yeah, was former Hell's Angel. Yeah, he's H.A. Uh, Chuck Zito, that was mm -hmm. in it in the later seasons, who who had a little bit of a like a conflict that that show was kind of his idea 
Um, yeah. I think that went to some litigation, but I guess they got it solved because he later on was on the show. Uh, yeah. He was in Oz as well, but Sonny was, was in the show. Los Angeles. Who's that? Sonny was Sonny Barger. Was yeah. In Sonny Barger was in the show yeah. who recently passed away. He was Lenny the pimp. Yep. And, uh, the sons of anarchy. So definitely Kurt Sutter definitely went uh, that extra mile, much like David Chase for the Sopranos to, to really give you that authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, Hollywood and the movies and, and right. shows are going right. to dramatize certain things, but I think Kurt done a really good job to try to get as close to as accurate as he could while still fulfilling a, you know, the show poor, you got to have the show portion for your audience, right? And bringing in guys like David, who was former hell's angels, Chuck Zito. And there was another guy that was in later. He didn't really have a major role, but he had a big beard, longer hair. He was in the later seasons. He's like a major shot caller for the hell's angels. His name escapes me at the moment, but he's, and that's an active guy. Yeah. They're pretty deep. I can't remember his name, but he's in there pretty heavy too. So yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with the bikers and the 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 Italians, that's that's like you said, that's the best of both worlds there. So you're fine. You're probably finding out all kinds of shit. Yeah. So I never, you know, I rode dirt bikes, rode you know ATVs once in a while, but I never rode a motorcycle on the street. So the more I'm talking to everybody and all of that stuff, where they're like, "Well, you even got a bike? I mean, you, you got a bike?" I'm like, "No." I'm like, but I've been, you know, I go every. Yes, ask my kids, I used to drag them every weekend, take them to Harley and walk around, just look at bikes. I'm like, no, but, you know, I'm looking at one. So I went down the street and there was a, a guy named Shadow, really cool guy. Was uh, He had three bikes he was selling and one of them was black and red flames and all that shit. I'm like, that's my bike right there. Never rode a fucking bike. I get on the bike and I ride home on the highway. <laughs> you never rode From that before? though, I'll tell you what, from that first ride, that was it. I went deep. I love that's my thing, man. I, I love the bikes. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So like you, you obviously, we talked earlier about the documentary that came out. When did that come about? Of you trying to put together a documentary and who reached out to who did you reach out to reels? Was it something that you put together and then pitched? How did that work? So it was really weird. I was talking where I was living. I was going to this uh, chiropractor. And I was just talking about my story. Now, this was right around when Family Secrets Trial was kind of midway. Mm -hmm. So it was already, you know, it was already up and going. And I was talking to my chiropractor and I was like, you know, he's asking, so how's it going? How's the trial? Because I'd share it with, you know, certain people. And um, he's like, how's it going and all that stuff? What are you, what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, everything's going good and, you know, going cool. He's like, you should really write a book. I'm like, dude, I barely fucking made it out of high school. I'm like, you ain't gonna find me writing a book. Trust me. If I write a book, I'm gonna be like, I was four years old, my dad got killed. End of story. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be the shortest book of your life. <laughs> he's like, Well, he's like, if you're open to it, I have another client who writes books and he's looking to do something true crime. I'm like, perfect, let me know. So I met this guy named Matt, and right away we hit it off. And he's like, yeah, man, dude, let's do this. And he never wrote a book before. It was his first book. He's like, yeah, if you, you know, he's like, and he was completely straightforward. He's like, listen, he's like, I'm just telling you, I no published book. I've never done a book, but I'd love, you know, all of this material. He's like, I'm definitely in for it. You know, if, if you want to do it, I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do it. So we started writing. And then that's when he said, listen, I have another friend uh this guy named jim that owns a production company here in the city he's like i was telling him a little bit about your story and he was like interested you know to see it so i said okay you know let me talk to him so we're writing the book and this is while the trial is going on um and the production company we ended up signing with them and uh 10 years later <laughs> we got it sold wow. and that's when the production company um reached out to another production company and brought them in and then they got it to reels and, and, uh, we got our, our two hour special. So you all sat on that for almost 10 years. Well, I, we didn't sit on it. <laughs> it, it was just, I think part of the, I think part of the issue was, <clears throat> um, the connections weren't, weren't there. Right. So they, they needed to go to somebody else that had a little bit bigger connections. And once they got to that company, they're like, yeah, this is a fucking slam dunk. And they, they got it done. 
That's one thing that I've learned from doing podcasting and reaching out to people and reaching out to guests is that networking and knowing the right people will open twice, three, four times as many doors than any sort of fucking degree or, or anything mm -hmm. like that, that you have from college that just don't really compute in this kind of world. I mean, obviously if you're getting stuff done on the behind the scenes market, yeah, you know, those kind of things are important, but as far as like networking, you just can't beat what you can get from networking and finding people that know people. If that makes right. sense and getting, and I think that's a two part though, too, is I, I found, I don't know what, I don't know how you found it, but, um, once I started meeting a lot more people, I found there was a lot of talkers too. Oh, very much. There's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I can do this. I can do this. I yeah. Can you that. definitely they, have they to can't do nothing through. but talk. Yeah. You definitely have to weed through the people yeah. that are talking to hear their self talk and then the people that can actually get shit done. Right. Um, I've only been doing this a little over a year and trust me, I've come across both. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that like to talk and just to hear their self talk and there's people to get shit done. Right. And, you know, unfortunately I've been able to develop somewhat of a relationship. I'm not like super close. We don't talk every day, but if there's things I need to know, like uh, for recent, you know, I had a guy reach out to me about the Hoffa situation where there's only one guy I know to talk to about Hoffa and that's Scott Bernstein. So, you know, I'm able to just text him and say, Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Like I said, it's not that we, you know, I'm not going to say we talk every day, but just yeah. to be able to have that avenue to, to fact check or to check on something is amazing when ordinarily you would not have that availability and you have to take people for what they say. At least you have people that you know are credible. I mean, Bernstein's written books. He's yeah. Every, yeah. I know Scott. They, yeah. Every time they dig for Hoffa, he's there. Yeah. So, I mean, like to, in my mind, if you're going to talk about Hoffa, there's nobody else in the world you need to go to other than him. In, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Knowing the right people is, is key for things like that. Now with your book, did you guys self publish? How did y'all do that? Y'all self publish that book? We self published first. Okay. <clears throat> and, uh, it was doing pretty good, you know, um, definitely more control and stuff like that. And when the documentary came around, the producer had known, uh, a company, that or actually an agent that was that liked the story and was you know wanted to pick it up and take it and get it sold to a publisher and we ended up doing it and they republished it when the documentary came out okay yeah all right so now after even all this you get the documentary out so the story's kind of out there and i watched it the last time it was on reels i think i tagged you on facebook when it was on mm -hmm. um, you're at you you actually had your own podcast the uh, uh, social, social social club, club. yeah, social club, and then you said earlier when me and you were talking off here, you might even have something else in the works. So tell us a little bit now about like what you're doing with your projects and something that our audience can maybe look forward to if they want to follow you and kind of you know learn some a little bit more about you. So we've been we haven't done the social club in <clears throat> a couple months just because we got tied up with some other stuff, but we still have that show. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another show starting called five HT podcast and it's, a, it's just a bunch of us like truth junkies. It's like four of us that are just picking topics and we just dig into those topics. Like, um, these giant skeletons that are being found, mm -hmm. you know, fucking 13 feet, foot tall skeletons. It's like, come on, where, where, why I didn't read about that in history books, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's stuff like that. Now we have, uh, that's on Instagram, Twitter, it's under five HT We're uh, we haven't shot the first episode. We're shooting it later this week, but we have like three episodes ready to shoot. And that's what we're actually starting on is the giants. But, um, now does that stand for anything that five HT? Yeah. It's the, the code for serotonin. I was about to say, my wife takes a five HTP pill. That's what I was <laughs> that's I it. thinking of. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah. It's a serotonin. Cause we're, you yeah. know, we're like fucking ADD, you know? Something yeah. gaps our attention. We're off to that subject. Yeah, my wife's like, she's like, I had to take my five HTP to sleep. I'm like, what the hell kind of drug is that you're taking? Over <laughs> she's straight laced as hell, so I knew it yeah. wasn't just breaking her balls a little bit. But I was, that's when you said that, I'm like, damn, my wife takes a pill. That's almost the name of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's uh, totally different. That's you know outside of the. We're not touching on any of the outfit or bikers or true right. crime. None of that shit. Like I've 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 
you know, I have the social club for that and we're doing this, this other stuff. We're going to get into nine 11 pyramids, all this oh, shit. Oh man, dude. Crazy you, stuff. You need to call me when you do your nine 11. For man. sure. Oh, no, for I'm sure. Give, I've got so many questions and yeah theories about that. And, you know, I, I interview a lot of guys, you know, related to organized crime in one way or another, be it, you know, somebody in a situation like yourself or Red Mehmet or people that were hands-on or authors, but I'm trying to get into some other things. And I actually just locked in a interview with a guy that was a nine 11 survivor. Awesome. Uh, the tower. Yeah. And I've been really wanting to get into something like that because there's yeah. so many things that I think the general public has left with unanswers or, they have or no sure. idea. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, you know, that's a whole nother podcast altogether. We go into the hours if I got into that shit, but yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely bring in on that for sure. No, for sure, man. Cause there's, there's so many questions like, and I'll, I'll just talk about this one thing and it will get off of it. Cause when I yeah. get, get to talking about that, it gets me going. <laughs> it's like, so obviously we're all, you know, we seen the, the planes hit the towers, right? but the one that hit the Pentagon to me, I don't buy that the Pentagon, the Pentagon, yeah. One of the most secure buildings on the fucking planet yep. can only give me a three second grainy as hell clip of something hitting that building. You can't even tell if it's a plane. Well, they can release, they, they have more footage. Oh, There's three, 300 plus cameras, but they'll yeah. only, they'll only let you see that one. Yeah. And the, the thing about that is, is you get into that. And there's no wreckage. There's no yeah. wreckage from a, a fuselage. You Nothing. Can't see the luggage. Yeah. You can't see an engine. Nothing. You can't see anything. That's yeah. you. So you know exactly where I'm going with this. So and yeah. you know what you know what hit the Pentagon, but you also know where it hit, right? Yeah. The room that it hit. Yeah. That yeah. housed all that information, right? Yeah. That housed all the the, the trillions of dollars that they all somehow couldn't find. Or Same account thing for with, uh, what was it? Building six at the World Trade Centers that wasn't seven, hit. the one that nothing yeah, hit. Yeah, and it yeah, fell. yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that fell when and nothing at all hit. Just imploded on its own. <laughs> yeah, this, I don't know. It's kind of under the radar because everybody right. focused obviously on the two towers that fell, but then that one fell later. And they said, I think it was the pilot that done the the um the Pentagon hit. I think it was Hani Hanjour. And that's how deep I went into this is I know these fucking guys' names. Yeah. He the the maneuver that he would have had to pull off to get that low and basically ride the fucking ground mm -hmm. to hit it the way he did was damn near impossible. They the flight instructors that they interviewed out of Florida, because they all went to school in Florida, right. they said this guy was horrible. Right. And for him to be able to pull off that, I think they want to say somewhere there was a test where they done like a simulation of doing what he did and only like two out of 10 pilots, like experienced pilots. Yeah. Like top gun <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. Like fucking yeah. Maverick or whatever. Maverick <laughs> right. Yeah. Maverick and Iceman were the only two guys yeah, right. to pull off this fucking maneuver. <laughs> and supposedly this asshole did it. And you didn't even, didn't even try to learn how to land. That, they, yeah. That's what that instructor said. He said, well, I didn't really think about it at the time, but they never actually wanted to learn about how to land. They only just knew about wanted to learn about how to fly and take well, off. And, and you saw that, some of those guys are somehow still alive, right? Supposedly, yeah. Yeah. It's it's so crazy, man. The, yeah. the rabbit holes that you can go down. With it's a deep like rabbit that. hole. But that's that's what the next podcast, that's what we're doing, is because of stuff like that. Like, yeah. no matter who you talk to, everybody's got, they've got theory. And yeah. some people dig more than others. And it's just more, in, to me, it's more interesting. Yeah, you can go down with, you can go with so many avenues with that, man. You can explore true crime stories. You can go with yeah. D.B. Cooper's. You know, stuff like I that. I just watched the documentary on D.B. Cooper. Isn't it was it good. Great? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. I've actually got an interview lined up with one of the guys whose team was behind that last episode. I'd reached out to him earlier in the year, and he couldn't talk to me about it because it hadn't came out yet. Oh, but okay. Now that it's came out, we're going to try to get together and do a show on it. But they also um, had some stuff to do with the Zodiac and, and stuff like that. So that's another cool it. story. Yeah. yeah. Another one that, you know, nobody's really got any closure on. So yeah, right. I, I like the idea of that podcast. Yeah. As well, so is that up and running now? Is that, is it's, that it's, we have, we have everything built and ready to go. We're finishing up, you know, the, the studio background and everything, but we have the Instagram page. We have the Twitter page. We have, okay. I think we have the YouTube page ready to go, but well, yeah, it's, it's like ready to go. Send me all that stuff in the link and we'll, yeah. we'll recognize that as five HT 
Mm -hmm. uh, leaving off the P because I know that's the pill there. That's the pill. <laughs> HC, we'll put that in there. We'll also put Joey's Social Club in there. And we'll also put a link to your book for our audience if they want to go pick that up and read a little bit more sure. you know, on this situation. Because all this is, you know, unfortunately that you had to go through this as a kid, you know, these types of things. And, and before we get out of here, I just got to ask, you know, being that Joe Lombardo in a sense did protect you somewhat, what was your feelings about his sentence? Do you think in the end he got what he deserved? Was it a little too harsh? Being that you were, you kind of had both ends of the spectrum. In a way, he was responsible for what happened to your father, but in a way, he helped protect you and your mother. So how does that make you feel about Joe? I think, he, personally, I think he got a raw deal on it. You know, I, yeah. I, I know he got convicted and Joe was who Joe was. I mean, yeah. uh, that's it. But the evidence that they had from 1974 there was almost nothing different that they had in the 2000s for the family secrets trial yeah you know i i, I think that he had a target and the government wanted him and i'll tell you what if he walked across the street not in a crosswalk they were gonna fucking convict him and make sure that he went away yeah you know you know the, the thing that i think pisses me off is that i don't know it pisses me off but i think it's just it's just the fed they can only get these guys when they're you know 90 years old it's like jesus at that point what the fuck's the point yeah they've done <laughs> you know? they've done their damage <laughs> right i mean what's the point you're gonna send a guy who's 90 years old and let him sit in a box i mean that i mean well no, and on the flip side of that you guys guys like tony spilatro who made his living doing a lot of you know rough gruesome shit yeah, the kind of end that he met with his brother on that hand, you know, is it kind of like you feel like they kind of got what they had coming to them to given everything that they dished out to other people? I think Tony did. I don't think Michael did. I, I don't think Michael, I don't, not in a disrespectful way, but I think he was more of a, a Hollywood, you know, off the guy he hung around with his brother, but he hung around with like stars and shit. I don't, he was, he wasn't out there like beating people up. And now, shit Michael, like I don't, I'll, I'll openly admit, I have really not a lot of information on him. Um, other than what the little bit I know of guys like Red Womet, and that's just the simple fact that he happened to be there right. um, when everything took place. Right. Um, but, yeah, as far as everything that, you know, I could get from Tony, obviously you don't want anything like that to happen, but I guess if you're in that life, you play and you live by a different set of rules outside of society. I really don't think Michael was, like, really in that life. Though. Yeah. I think he was more just, you know, his brother. Well, and I think, too, if, if I know my brother is this big, hot shot heavyweight, I might use that to my advantage for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's hanging around with fucking yeah. Frank Sinatra and shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, listen, man, I'm glad you could come on the show. I had, a, um, you know, obviously the, the unfortunate underlying circumstances of all this is that, you know, there was a, you know, a, a murder committed. Unfortunately, it had to be, you know, your father, but you, you've grown up, you've, you know, investigated this yourself. You've got a documentary made, you've got a book made. You, you mentioned earlier too, that you had had some communication. Do you have any sort of like relationships related to guys that might still be in the life or how does, you know, how's that sitting right now? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of people I talk to. So, so they're cool with you in that. Cause I, I think this is kind of like, yeah. And obviously I don't want to name names or anything like that. No. Yeah. You know, I think at this point, they kind of know you and your father. Unfortunately, those kind of things are just stuff that I guess you want to say cost of doing business, but I, I don't want to make light of the fact that this is somebody's life. But in the mob, that is just a, that's basically like in my job, if I have to fire somebody, it's but business. It's, yeah, in the mob, it's yeah. just business. That's how they look right. at it. Right. And that's all it is. Yeah. You know, the, the couple of people that, that I have talked to, um, a couple of them have said, they're like, well, I, you know, I know your brother and I know you, I just wasn't sure like how you felt about things, you know, yeah. like they weren't sure if I was like, fuck you guys. Or if I was like, you know, oh, yeah. well, that's why I asked a question. Cause I wouldn't yeah. be sure where you sit at that either. You know, I don't know where I would sit at that. Yeah. I mean, but you know, once, once they got to know me, they, they understand where, where I sit and they're more than comfortable. I mean, I talk to people all the time, Okay, you know, 
Well, listen, man, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I think this I appreciate been, uh, you having me. Yeah, this has been a fantastic interview. I've enjoyed it thoroughly to get a lot of information from this side of the tracks because I think I heard you talk about, and it may have been in my friend Adrian's podcast, who shout out to him, Invest Yourself Clothing. Yeah, great guy. That a lot of times the victims get overshadowed by the people that commit the crimes. Well, that's America. That's how America yeah. is. Everybody loves Tony Soprano. Exactly. And that's what I think you heard you say. And that's, it, it was so moving to hear you say that because you're absolutely right. You know, people want to glorify Tony. Oh, wait, Tony did this. Tony did that. You know, Joe Lombardo did this. Joe Lombardo did that. But the fact is, at the end of the day, some of the decisions that they made affected other people. Sure. Obviously, like yourself. So, like you said, I think those stories are just as important, if not more important, than the guy that was doing them or, or orchestrated them for sure. Well, look at Pat Spilatro. We're, we were in court together. We, at that point, only at that point, we got in a huge fight between him and I did. But Pat Spilatro was no different than I was or my brother was. Mm -hmm. We only wanted, at that point, there was no outfit. There was nothing. There were no fat. We just wanted an answer of who killed our family member. You know, he profited very well. He's very, you know, close with outfit guys. But at that point, everything changed for yeah. him and he wanted to know no different than us. So, you know, I, I, I think, like you said, that's an important, important part of it. Yeah, absolutely. To get those stories out there. Yeah. Like I said, man, we're going to put your book in our show notes for people that want to go pick that up. We'll put both of your podcast, always social club and the new one you got coming out. Cause I think that's very interesting. And please, if you want another mouth on the nine 11 show, for sure, man, for sure. Holler, man, I can get you my two cents for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be a, you know, a three, four part show. Up, oh, yeah, course. yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Joey Seifer. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Joey, we appreciate it, my friend. Thanks. Have a good one, man.